Hey friends, Dan here with another Amiga related video today. I know you always look forward to these ones. And today as well it's going to be quite special because in this video I'm going to recreate my first ever Amiga experience. I'm going to go all the way back to the first Amiga pack that I received for Christmas 1991. Now if you only care about the unboxing and you want to just check out the hardware, skip to this time code here because I know some people like, you know, have an attention span of a goldfish on YouTube. For everybody else, I want to tell you my story about my first ever Amiga and share the memories I have of that machine with you. Now, I'll be honest, I never expected to actually get an Amiga. Um, I had a Commodore Plus 4 before that that my parents got me in the late 80s. Anyone who knows anything about Commodore history will know that the Plus 4 was a phenomenal failure. And I think around the time my parents got mine, um, a local shop was selling them off for about £25 each. So I was only a little kid at the time. I just wanted a computer, I didn't really care what it was. So they got me this really cheap machine. I was quite happy with it, but then when the 90s kind of came around, I noticed a lot of my friends at school started getting like Amiga 500s and uh, Mega Drives and Atari STs. And I did want to upgrade my computer, but not to an Amiga. I, you know, I used to read about Amigas in catalogues and magazines and stuff and think that they were like for rich kids. I never had any chance of owning one, I thought. So I asked my parents if I could have a Commodore 64 and I was hoping that Santa was going to bring me a C64 for Christmas 1991 and I was actually sure that I was going to get it that on Christmas Eve 1991 I still vividly remember this as being one of the first heartbreaks that I had as a kid. I was in town with my mother doing some shopping on Christmas Eve and I remember saying to her maybe Santa's going to bring me a Commodore 64 tomorrow can we have a look in Dixon's and maybe get some games so I've got something to play on the machine tomorrow. And she looked me in the eyes and, you know, she looked really sad and she goes, Look, son, I'm really sorry, but Santa's not going to be bringing you a Commodore 64 for Christmas this year. And I remember my heart just sinking and thinking, all right, maybe they haven't got the money for it. That's fine. My plus four is all right. I can stick with it for a few more years. And then Christmas morning rolled around and I opened my Amiga 500 Plus. And here is a picture of me on Christmas Day. That moment, my eyes are on stalks opening my A500 Plus. Now, I've actually got the same pack again, um, thanks to eBay. I managed to get one of these for a pretty decent price and it looks to be in good condition as well. Now this is actually the same pack that I unboxed on Christmas morning 1991, the cartoon classics. As I said, you know, for most people, it's not really an A500 pack that I read all that much about because it was right at the end of the Amiga 500's life. I mean, like four months after this came out, the Amiga 600 came out and then the 500 was discontinued. That was probably my second heartbreak when I was a kid. So in this video, we're going to get this machine set up. Um, hopefully it's going to bring back some nostalgic memories of, you know, checking out what's in the box and playing a few of the games and bits of software that were included in this. So let's get it on the table and get the box open. Now, I did actually forget just how big this box is. In hindsight, I maybe should have filmed this in my living room on the floor where I've got a bit more room, but we can just about fit this massive box on the corner of my table in my home office. I do love the design of the Cartoon Classics packaging, though. It's, you know, really vivid colours, and I think it really stands out. And I remember being really impressed when I first unwrapped this on Christmas morning when I was a kid. And if you look at the back of the box, you can get a bit more detail on the included software. It was based around cartoons of the day. Uh, the Simpsons was massive then. Uh, Captain Planet, we've got D-Paint and Lemmings. We'll go into the software in a bit more detail soon, but the really exciting stuff obviously lies inside the box. Now, I'll try and get this open without tearing any of the little fastening clips on the side, because I do want to keep it in good condition. And there we are, the treasure within. And obviously this is second hand, it has been used before, but it looks like the seller has actually retained a few of the original uh, pieces of packaging, like these foam inserts on the side. Um, I think these kind of little bits of packaging here are third party, but yeah, this is original. And these Ziploc bags that seem to have all of the documentation in there, you've got the Quick Connect guide that I do remember looking at that on Christmas morning in 91, had to get set up, and there were some pretty beefy manuals included with this too. And it looks like they, uh, they could all be in there, so we'll check that out in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, we have the software here, not in its original boxes, but it looks like there are plenty of discs included and they look in pretty good quality. Uh, there's Captain Planet on the front there, and we'll look at them in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, down the front here we have all the RF cables, um, which I will not be using because RF is pretty terrible quality. And I've got an RGB to SCART cable that will look a lot nicer. I remember getting this actually, an included special edition of Amiga format that was, um, yeah, like it says there, exclusively free with the Cartoon Classics pack. 
And I'm not sure I've seen a scan of this on like archive.org or anything, but I remember reading that cover to cover when I was a kid, so I'll have to get that scanned if it's not uploaded anywhere. Uh, this looks like the original Amiga Tank Mouse, a two-button mouse that came included with um, all Amigas up to about the... I think the Amiga 3000 may have changed the mouse, but most of them came with this uh, classic Amiga design, which uh, is not the most comfortable to hold today, but it wasn't bad for the era. You know, two-button mouse, and it was rather responsive for what it is, but most people replaced it. You know, it's got a rollerball in there, which uh, looks a bit grubby. Might have to give that a bit of a clean. And then... At the back of the box, uh, yeah, this feels like the Amiga Power Supply. A massive brick that came with all of the uh, lower-end wedge-shaped Amigas. Never was a big fan of this. It had the switch on the Power Supply that was a bit weird, and I'd always end up kicking it under the table and accidentally turning it off. Uh, this is one of the lighter ones, but actually I think the Amiga 500 Power Supply was rated higher than the A600 and 1200, so it's a pretty good one to own if you've got some expansions on your later Amigas. And, uh, oh yes, I'd forgotten about this. I was never a fan of this little device here. The horror that is the A520 TV modulator. Um, yeah, the Amiga 500 didn't have a television modulator built in, so they included this, which was a really bad design. It would often come loose and fall out the back of the machine. It plugged into the Amiga's RGB port on the back and then gave you uh, audio and uh, composite video out there as well. And there was... Uh, yeah, look at those little feet on the bottom, they were really flimsy. I remember having to put cardboard underneath it to kind of position it at one point. And you got the RF output on the back there. Yeah, it was never a great design. I actually think my first ever Amiga failure that I had was uh, with the modulator failing. I had to return it to Dixon's to get a replacement that took a couple of weeks. Yeah, never a fan of the modulator. And I think that's about it. You know, we've got the, the main event in here now, the Amiga 500 Plus. Now, I'm going to try and take out these... Um, polystyrene inserts without damaging them so let's carefully remove them here and yeah these are by the looks of it the original ones that came included as you can see it's kind of molded to the shape of the Amiga 500 there so definitely worth keeping hold of those uh, very useful for you know packaging this away and moving it it's always useful to have the original packaging uh, this bubble wrap though this is not the original I remember this came in like a clear kind of packaging when I was a kid so the sellers obviously put this on to protect it a bit more Let's take off the tape here. And it actually looks to be in pretty decent condition. Um, I will say the seller did say the battery has been removed. I will check that because the A500 Plus does have a battery and that can leak, but he told me that had been removed. And yeah, it looks quite nice. I mean, the keyboard has yellowed ever so slightly, but I've seen a lot worse in computers of this age. Uh, nothing that a little bit of retro brighting won't cure. So yeah, really impressed with this, looks really good. So what we're going to do now is I'll get the TV in here and we'll get all the peripherals hooked up and we'll test out the Amiga 500 Plus and see how it runs. Now just before we do that, I thought we'd have a look at the included contents of the Cartoon Classics pack. Obviously we've got the Amiga 500 Plus itself with a full 96 key included keyboard uh, with two extra symbols on this one for international keyboard layouts. I did always really like the look of the later Amiga case badges that did tell you the model number. They seemed a bit more informative than the earlier kind of just generic Commodore logos that were on the older machines. On the right we've got the three and a half inch floppy drive and this was the first time I'd used three and a half inch discs. It felt like, you know, something out of the future that could, that could hold almost a megabyte. On the back we've got the usual Amiga ports, mouse and joystick, the RCA Phono audio ports, uh, external disk drive connector, serial parallel, uh, power supply connector, RGB video and a mono composite video output there, the only output in black and white. On the left side of the Amiga we had uh, the expansion port that connected to accelerators, hard disks, CD-ROM drives and the action replay cartridge as well. Uh, on the bottom we had the RAM expansion, the trapdoor port that would hold an extra 1 megabyte of chip RAM on the Amiga 500. And let's have a closer look at this Amiga Format Special Edition because I'd actually kind of forgotten that this came with the Cartoon Classics pack and I read this cover to cover when I was a kid and found it really interesting um, you know, to see kind of what other games were available for the platform and it did kind of serve as a very friendly welcome to the Amiga for new users. A lot more so than those, uh, you know, kind of stuffy manuals that were included by Commodore. And also give you lots of ways that you'd want to spend your parents' money on extra hardware and software. So, uh, yeah, they were clued up. 
<laughs> and this was really interesting. This was the story of the Amiga. So new users get to read about, like, you know, RJ Michael and Jay Minor and the classic tale of the Amiga, which was really interesting. And again, you get a section here on setting up your system that was a lot easier to follow than the included Commodore documentation. So, yeah, that was really worthwhile to have in there. Uh, they were going quite heavy on CDTV, you can see here, a look into the future. And that was what Commodore were really pushing at the time as the future of home living room entertainment. I did get one a year or two later, but not many other people did. It was a phenomenal failure. I've actually got videos on the CDTV if you're interested. A screenplay that showed you other games you may want to get hold of and you're probably drooling over on Christmas Day when you got your Amiga 500 Plus. And this bit was quite useful, Game Busters, it gave you some tips on the included games with the Cartoon Classics pack. Not outright cheats, but would just help you pass those uh, you know, trickier areas of the game. So that was worthwhile. Uh, some more expansions you may want to get hold of there. Uh, yeah, like this, showing you hard disks and printers and external floppy disk drives. And it looks like someone's actually worked out how much they want to spend in the top right of the page there. Uh, subscribe to the mag, it's always in there, isn't it? This bit was really interesting when I was a kid. It was the first time I'd seen the Amiga demo scene. Uh, coming from the Plus Four, I wasn't really aware of the demo scene, and I thought, you know, how do you get hold of these? They look amazing. And then, obviously, you had to send off uh, checks or postal orders to public domain libraries. Uh, an introduction to Workbench 2.0 here. That was really handy, you know, if you never used a GUI before or upgraded from an older Amiga. And, yeah, that's about it. I did actually notice they're actually advertising the Bart vs. the Space Mutants game quite heavily in this magazine, despite the fact that it was included for free with the pack, so uh, yeah, that was a bit of a weird choice of advertising there. Now let's have a look at the software that came with the Cartoon Classics pack, all bundled up with elastic bands here, hopefully all the discs are included, they look in good condition. Uh, Captain Planet that just came on one floppy disk as I remember, by Mindscape. Uh, this is Bart vs. the Space Mutants. Two discs, one had a really cool cartoon introduction, and uh, the second disc was the game itself. Oh, the amazing Lemmings came included with it too. Still an incredible game. I'll boot these up and show you them in just a moment. And we had the operating system discs, the Amiga Workbench version 204, 204 that came with the A500+, Plus. Uh, extras and fonts discs included, and then D-Paint 3. I used to spend so long on that program as a kid just messing around with it. Never really all that artistic, but it was very, very cool to play with. So yeah, it looks like all the software is here. Uh, let's have a look at the included manuals now. It looks like there's quite a lot in this uh, little Ziploc bag here. Yeah, and they were actually a little bit <laughs> trickier to get out of the bag than I first presumed, so let's just do a quick edit there. Now we've got the uh, Quick Connect Guide here. Uh, that shows you how to um, hook up your Amiga without going through the main manual. So I do remember following this on Christmas Day morning. That was really useful. And uh, looking at the other add-ons, thinking, oh, I wish I had all those, like a modem and everything. Uh, shows you what should be in there. So, yeah, that's quite useful. You must complete your warranty card. Failure to register your Commodore equipment could lead to delays in it being repaired should it fail. And it looks like we may have all of the uh, original warranty information here. There we go, look at this. Congratulations on the purchase of your new Commodore home computer, of, with which I'm sure you'll spend many happy hours. As you know, the system is under warranty for a 12-month period. All you have to do is complete your warranty card, and you'll get a free pocket-sized Commodore calculator, so hurry, don't delay. I don't think I have actually sent that off. I certainly never got a calculator when I was a kid. Would have liked one, though. A uh, little reminder there about the uh, floppy disk drive cardboard head protector, uh, just to take it out and... Uh, Avoid damaging your disk drive. Um, something here about copying disks so you don't damage your original workbench disks. A D-Paint 3 upgrade order form. Uh, more warranty information. Looks like someone's actually cut this in half and sent it away. Very sensible. And uh, well, it looks like warranties at this stage were carried out by Granada here in the UK. So I knew that Wang did it a couple of years later. don't remember Granada doing it though. Um, just something there if you've got problems using your machine, like a little troubleshooter guide. And something here about uh, turning the Amiga off and on and waiting 30 seconds. you think they could have put all this in the front of the manual <laughs> instead of having all of these uh, separate little sheets included, but there you go. Good that they're all still there. Uh, our quality control check in the factory by the looks of it. And this looks interesting. The Commodore Gift Shop. And what's going to be in here? Look at... This, this looks like Commodore merchandise. <laughs> How amazing. 
a Commodore teddy bear, we've got mugs, key rings, uh, a lighter, very healthy. Uh, on the other side of it we've got some uh, rather dodgy looking uh, late 80s, early 90s filofaxes, uh, calculators, a Commodore belt, amazing. Oh and look at the fashion here, <laughs> Commodore shell suits or track suits. Uh, and Chelsea FC. How amazing is that? Look at that all Commodore branded up. They look really trendy, don't they? It's Commodore did sponsor Chelsea Football Club for a while, so it looks like they were taking up their stadium. Look at those outfits. And yes, you are seeing that correctly. She is wearing Commodore branded socks. I would love a pair of those. Uh, price is not too bad, actually, looking here. Um, tend to range from about five to ten pounds for the... Uh, various Commodore clothing that you could buy, so obviously it'd be probably double or triple that price in today's money, but yeah, that is incredible. I'd love to own some of that back then. I'll have to get checking eBay a bit later. Uh, we have some uh, more warranty information here. On-site maintenance, which um, I know they did with the later Amigas, like the A600. Um, I didn't know they offered that on the Amiga 500, so that would have been quite useful. An engineer coming out of your house and actually fixing your Amiga on-site. Uh, the Amiga 500 manual here, introducing the A500 and 500 Plus. Uh, this was really just for the hardware. I didn't really cover much of the software. And yeah, all these illustrations as opposed to uh, actual photographs. One thing I always found really cool in the Amiga manuals though was that it would show you the schematics for the hardware in the back, like the various chips and uh, aspects of the motherboard, which I think they kind of went a bit, you know, into a bit too much detail for a manual, but I wasn't complaining. As a kid that was quite into amateur electronics at the time, and I was doing that kind of stuff at school, this was really interesting to look through, so I'm not sure whether it was really commonplace back then, but I definitely didn't get anything like this in my Commodore Plus 4 manual, but it was really interesting to look at. And then we had the uh, using the Amiga Workbench manual that was an introduction to Amiga DOS version 2.0, uh, talking me through a few of the shell commands and how to use the graphical user interface. Uh, you know, for me, this was the first machine I owned with a GUI, so I did actually spend quite a bit of time um, working my way through this and learning how to use a mouse and everything. Uh, we have some um, instructions, very small instruction manuals for the games are included too. They all seem to be there. And this manual is actually pretty big for what it is. <laughs> It's actually bigger than most manuals that you get with computers these days for the A520 modulator uh, in various languages. So yeah, I won't be using the modulator. And finally, the uh, manual for D-Paint 3, um, the paint and animation program. I do actually remember something really cool about this. If you looked in the corner, uh, see Dan Silver there on his bike, they will give you a little flipbook animation. So you could just uh, flip through the pages and see him on his unicycle there. That's a pretty nice touch, you know, as it was the first version of D-Paint with, uh, with animation, so yeah, I thought that was pretty nice. Okay, so that's been a look at the contents of the pack. Let's finally get the A500 Plus set up and see how everything works. Okay, so we've got everything set up on my uh, rather cramped table here in my home office now. Um, I managed to get my A500 and this uh, really crappy supermarket monitor that I got about eight years ago now, um, which will do the job for this video. I've got it connected via the um, RGB to SCART connector on the TV, um, which means I can avoid using that horrible A520 modulator. Normally I play my Amiga on a CRT, but they don't come out too well on camera. So for the purposes of this video, you should hopefully be able to see it all right on this screen. So everything's connected up, got the mouse here, got the best joystick ever, the uh, zip stick attached to the uh, joystick port on the Amiga. So if I flip the power switch on the brick, it should come to life. Power lights on, there we go, we get the flashing white screens. And there is that classic Kickstart 2.0 disc insert screen, and if we listen carefully... I can hear the floppy drive ticking away. I do remember when I first got my Amiga, the fact that the floppy drive like clicked every two or three seconds. Um, <laughs> I did think something was wrong with it. At one stage, I read in the manual that the Amiga 500 Plus had a built-in clock, um, which I will just say that has been removed from this machine. Um, so don't worry, it's not deteriorating inside or anything like that. Um, but I did originally think that was the sound of the clock ticking when I was a kid, so yeah, not my proudest moment. Now let's go through the software that was included with the A500 Plus. Um, I'm gonna put in now the first ever Amiga program I loaded, and that was Bart versus the Space Mutants. Now the version that you got with this actually had a pretty impressive animated introduction. Um, assuming the discs that have been bundled with the machine work properly, we should be able to watch that now. 
And there we are, that classic Ocean logo. Um, this TV is so crap, I actually can't change the aspect ratio. So everything will look a little bit stretched because it um, upscales it to 16.9. But, you know, it should come out all right in the video, I think. But obviously, if you want to play your Amigas um, on a modern TV, put it in 4x3 um, or even better. Get a nice old school CRT that looks so much better. Wow, man. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? Now, it does look a bit naff today, but like I said before, I'd come from the Commodore Plus 4, um, which was, you know, quite a rudimentary 8-bit machine. Seeing graphics and animation and sample speech like that, you know, blew my mind when I first loaded up this demo. Then if we insert disc 2... Press fire. Then we can see a bit of the game, which uh, I was never all that good at this game. It was quite tricky. In level one, you had to spray paint everything that was pink, purple, or vice versa, or cover up everything that was purple. Because the aliens were only keen on purple things, as I recall. Bit weird. There we go. Find the purple objects, spray paint or get rid of them in any way you can. So there's Bart. We can control him with the joystick. And I think if we press down, you can see he's an alien, so if I jump at his head, I then collect a letter. So I've got the M for Maggie there. So I need to find some spray paint. It's been a long time since I played this game. And there's a tin up there, okay. So we get through these aliens. And then I imagine jump on these. There we go. And spray things. And we go back into the bin. Yeah, I do remember you get two hits and then you've lost a life. And I remember this bit here, you can actually make a phone call to Mo. Um, I'm not sure how you do it though. Like spacebar. You have to go through your items. Um, yeah, I can't remember how you do that, but you can make a phone call and Mo comes out. And then with these here, yeah, you cover up the purple things with the handkerchiefs on the line. And it's going to spray paint there. And a bee came out and got me. <laughs> so there you go, that's Bart versus the Space Mutants. Let's try another game now, shall we? And this next game should need no introduction. Everyone remembers that classic DMA design logo, um, released on Cygnosis in 1991. I am talking about the legendary Lemmings. And uh, oh, this is a proper track loader. My disk drive's going crazy. <laughs> I was like really loud floppy drives on the Amiga. Uh, now this game, I'm kind of ashamed to say, even though it came bundled with my Amiga, this was probably the least played Amiga game that I had in, in the pack for the first month. Uh, just because, you know, I was a little kid and 
I didn't really understand how to play the game at first when I loaded it up on Christmas Day afternoon. It wasn't until a friend from school came over a couple of weeks later taught me how to play it and then I became totally hooked on this game and it did eventually become my most played Amiga game for a long time and you know to this day it's still up there in my top 10 games ever and um, you know for me it was a bit of a new concept though because I come from an 8-bit machine even getting used to using a mouse was you know a novelty and something new I had to learn and I probably don't need to explain the rules of lemmings to every everyone watching this video will know but the lemmings come out the trap door you've got to get them in the exit using the tools available so on this one um, you just dig and they go down. You can speed them up by using the crosshairs here on the plus and minus. And that was fun. Obviously, the best thing to do that was always lots of fun was to nuke the lemmings. And um, I used to get quite a lot of satisfaction out of getting all the lemmings out and then just blowing them up around the screen when I was a kid. Yeah, pretty twisted kid. And the final game in the Cartoon Classics pack was Captain Planet. Now, I don't know if you remember Captain Planet. That was a pretty cheesy... Um, late 80s, early 90s, Saturday morning kids TV show. Now my brother and I actually used to get up and watch it quite early on a Saturday morning. I think it was on just before or after a show called Top Banana. I've got some vague memories of watching that. Now by far the best thing about this game is this banging Ben Daglish soundtrack that goes all the way through it. He did the music for the entire game. I interviewed him on my podcast about a year ago. He'd actually forgotten that he'd done the music for Captain Planet until I played a bit of it to him and he's like, oh yeah, that's me. Um, but you know, we used to put this game on and just leave the music playing while we tidied our bedroom. It was, you know, really, really good. The game itself um, got pretty average reviews in most of the Amiga magazines. I think Amiga 4 might give it like, you know, mid-40s, like 45% or something. So it wasn't really rated as a decent game back in the day. But for me being, you know, one of three Amiga games that I had and being that I did really like platform games when I was a kid, I used to play this for ages. And uh, still to this day, in terms of nostalgia, it is one of my all-time favorite Amiga games. Not many people agree with that unless you got the Cartoon Classics back. But yeah, it is just, you know, it's very cheesy. The colours, you got all that kind of copper effects in the clouds there as well. The music's good and it's a good game if you just want to sit back and have a bit of mindless platforming action for a bit. So yeah, I've always been quite a big fan of Captain Planet. Now obviously it wasn't all about the games with the Amiga. The Amiga was also a very good productivity machine and had a very decent operating system for the day. Especially on the Amiga 500 Plus which brought Amiga DOS version 2 to the average user. Um, before that, it was only available on the very expensive Amiga 3000. And I remember, you know, when you put the, the original disc in, it gives you a key map selection, so we'll say no for now. And this was quite a departure from the previous Amiga workbench. It gave you this kind of pseudo 3D look. And I read interviews with the Amiga uh, OS designers where they say that actually this was quite heavily influenced by Next. So it looks a lot more professional than Amiga workbench uh, 1.3, for example. And as you can see here, um, these are some of the included programs. Uh, I used to look around these in wonder, because again, bearing in mind, this was my first machine with a graphical user interface. The only other machine that I'd used was a Apple Macintosh, a black and white like Mac Classic at my auntie's print shop one summer, but you know, the having a graphical user interface like Amiga Workbench was just something brand new to me. And learning my way around it did take a bit of time, but I was really impressed by it. I used to look through the programs in wonder and just think, you know, what is all this stuff? What's it do? Because on the Commodore 8-bit machines, you were dropped into the command line. Obviously, the program that everybody remembers on the Amiga Workbench, and probably the one that most people fired up first, was the Say command, which, uh, you know, still impresses me to this day. The fact that your computer can talk. And a good test of the keyboard here. That seems to work. Hello, Amiga. And finally, let's have a look at one of the biggest selling points of the Amiga 500 Cartoon Classics pack, the fact that you can make your own cartoons with it using this program, Deluxe Paint 3. Now, this program used to entertain me for hours when I was a kid. I've given this Amiga a little bit more RAM, actually. I've put another 512K in the trapdoor port because one thing I'd always find with d was that you'd run out of memory quite a lot. If you wanted to make a cartoon in one megabyte of memory, you'd get about maybe 10, 15 frames before you ran out of RAM. Uh, but this was a really cool program, especially for you know someone like me who was really into drawing and animation and had come to this machine with fresh eyes coming from an 8-bit world, having the power to actually create your own drawings on the screen um, even though I wasn't very good at it, was, you know, captivating. And you did get a few examples with it as well that really showed off the power of Deluxe Paint. Now, that was one thing about the Amiga 500, that if you didn't have an external disk drive or a hard disk, you'd spend a lot of time swapping disks. So let's load up a few of the example pictures that may bring back a, a few memories. 
Now this was the art disc. And of course, uh, the picture that everybody remembers from D-Paint. And it was kind of their mascot, really. Um, King Tut. And if you weren't looking at games adverts, this was generally the picture that you saw in catalogues and magazines to advertise the Amiga. Uh, because, you know, looking at that even today, for a pixel artist to create that in such detail must have taken quite a long time. It's signed A.H. I'm not exactly sure who that is. <laughs> it was said Gorilla. I remember that picture as well. Again, very impressive. And there was something brand new in version 3 of D-Paint, and that was the fact that it had animation. So I can load up one of the included animations. If the discs all work. There we go, animation disc. Let's see what I remember in here. H. Bright Hill. I do remember that one. That was like a Charlie Chaplin kind of guy. And now that's loaded in. We can play it, I believe, by um, going to the menu up here. And going to control, play. Yeah, number four on the keyboard. There we go. And there is a finished result, which, um, you know, is pretty impressive for the early 90s on a 7 megahertz machine with a megabyte of memory. So having this power in your hands back in the day in your bedroom at home uh, and being able to do quality animation like this was just revolutionary at the time so I did spend a lot of time playing around with D-Paint never any good at it though unfortunately so there you go that's been a nice nostalgic look back at my first ever Amiga the A500 Plus and uh, yeah I do remember you know just playing with that machine again kind of all those vivid memories and that feeling of wonder when I first set that machine up and what a leap in technology it really seemed at the time so maybe you remember your first Amiga pack that you got or maybe a computer that you got when you were a kid that's still got some really fond memories please do leave a comment on the video i'd love to hear your stories thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next vid mm -hmm.